well, thanks for having me, Blake. Uh, so I am the founder of Buoyant, one of the founders of Buoyant, and we make a service mesh called Linkerd. It's an open source project. Uh, and it's a CNCF project and uh, recently graduated, which is kind of the top tier of project maturity um, in the CNCF. So we're very happy about that. And what Linkerd does uh, is it's very Kubernetes focused. So if you're running an application on Kubernetes, it gives you a set of features around security, a set of features around observability, and a set of features around reliability uh, at the platform level. So the application code does not need to change. Nice. And then, so since we are at KubeCon 2021, um, any big announcements with Buoyant, Linkerd? Yeah. So Linkerd, the big announcements are number one, graduation, which is, you know, a big deal for us, at least in our little CNCF world. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And then uh, we recently released Linkerd 2.11, which introduces policy. So that means if you have services A and B and C all running in your Kubernetes cluster, you can now restrict what types of communication are allowed to happen. So maybe A is not allowed to talk to B for whatever reason. So that's now something that Linkerd can enforce for you. So you have a very nice kind of security posture with Linkerd because it's giving you mutual TLS, which means it's encrypting all the traffic on your cluster. It's validating the identity on both sides of the connection. Now we're layering policy on top of that. So you get not just the security benefits of uh, encryption of data in transit, but you also get micro segmentation and you get the ability to really control what types of traffic are allowed to happen on your cluster. And then when we talk about uh, mesh, it has a lot of hype. And so for a lot mm -hmm. of people, they're like, well, what what are some of the advantages I get using it? And kind of like, how are you solutioning it for developers? Yeah, that's right. So actually, a lot of our goals in the service mesh world is not to affect the developer at all. So, yeah. you know, our view is that the developer should be focused on building the business logic, you know, that powers the fundamental economic engine of their company. And what's happening with the service mesh and Kubernetes should be the platform underneath that. So we try to not affect the developers and we try very much to build a service mesh that uh, is transparent and that's seamless. And the people who do have to think about Linkerd are the, the platform owners or the Kubernetes operators. And for them, uh, our mission with Linkerd is to make it the lightest, fastest and simplest service mesh in the world. And by simple, I mean the operational complexity is kept to a minimum. So we make it so that, you know, you can understand what it's doing and you can build a mental model. And then if it breaks at three in the morning, which rarely happens, you can uh, you can diagnose it and you can inspect it and you can understand what parts need to be fixed. So that's the goal for Linkerd. And I think that's where Linkerd really excels. It's simpler. There are, you know, as you say, there's a lot of hype. In the service mesh world, there's a lot of different service mesh projects. Linkerd is the one that is known for its simplicity and for its performance. Nice. And if we take a step back on Linkerd, how did how did that all come about? What was the kind of the inspiration and how did that get started? Yeah. So Buoyant, you know, the company behind Linkerd created Linkerd way back in the dark ages of 2016. And it was the first service mesh. It was the one to introduce that term to the world. Wow. And we started doing that because my co-founder, Oliver, and I, were engineers at Twitter, and Twitter had gone through this infrastructure migration from monolithic Ruby on Rails app to this big distributed system that was actually basically cloud native, although we didn't call it that at the time. And one of the fundamental things that Twitter learned during that transformation that made that actually possible was that managing the communication between the microservices was crucial to this being a performant and secure system. And so with Linkerd, we basically decided to take that idea, and then you know in the early days we actually took some of the Twitter open source. We've moved away from that since, mm -hmm. uh, and turned that into something that anyone can use. And we've especially focused on the Kubernetes world because that's where most of the cloud native applications are being run today. Nice. And I always think about Twitter. They said like back way back when, every time like Justin Bieber started to trend, it was like the building was like going through an earthquake. Just right. the scalability was insane. Yeah. yeah, it was an interesting time to be there. And you know, Twitter was almost. The fact that it failed so often was almost like Fail this well. lovable, right? Exactly. People had parties. There was a cute little mascot. This is <laughs> lovable thing, but you know, it's not really a viable way to run a business. Um, so the miraculous part about that transformation is that it worked. You know, it's rare for something that big to work, um, and that you know kind of made a big impact on on Oliver and myself. And we wanted to take that same technology, bring it to the rest of the world, who we knew was going to have the same problem. Ah, that's very really cool. 
And what, what's some of the feedback that you've gotten so far from anyone using it? Oh, they think it sucks. They don't want it. It's uh, terrible. No. No, the feedback is it's amazing. <laughs> it's the only thing that, you know, makes this thing work. Yeah, no, the feedback has been really great. You know, at this point, um, Linkerd powers uh, the production infrastructure of tons of organizations around the world, ranging from Microsoft to Nordstrom to, um, you know, uh, Chase Bank to like all sorts of startups. Um, and uh, I think the real value that it brings to the table is without something like Linkerd, all of those features that you want, whether it's mutual TLS or whether it's uh, request level load balancing or whether it's uh, traffic splitting for canary deploys, those all have to be implemented at the application. Right? Kubernetes can't do that for you. It's operating one level too low. And doing it at the application level is really annoying because it's not really business logic, right? It's kind of, it's platform logic. So being able to decouple that from the application code and bring it down to the platform level gives you a lot of power because then the developers can focus on their job, mm. the platform team can focus on their job, and everyone can live together in perfect harmony forever. Ah, nice. That's, that's, that's a great way to put it. And if we, uh, you know, with your unique perspective and visibility, talking to customers, that sort of thing, what are some of the trends that you're seeing this year? Yeah, so for us, uh, we definitely see a big trend around security and people, you know, as the adoption of Kubernetes becomes more mature, um, people now feel comfortable running it and they're tackling the next challenge, which is, well, how do we do it securely? And especially if you have cust uh, sensitive customer data, if you have anything with HIPAA concerns, or PCI concerns, or anything like that, you're looking for ways to secure the data, not just at rest, but also in transit. And so that's a big, big driver for, for Linkerd. Um, and then I'd say another big driver um, is just uh, there's an increased recognition that the, what what Linkerd brings to Kubernetes is kind of, it, it almost has to be there. Like it's hard to build a Kubernetes application without having some kind of service mesh in there just because, like I said, Kubernetes, and I think this is to Kubernetes' credit, it is a well-defined project. Like it has a boundary where it says, okay, beyond this, it's not my job. Like something else has to be there. And between that and the application, I'll put my hand over here, uh, mm -hmm. There is a gap, right? And that's where the service mesh fits. So I think people are really recognizing that as the service mesh matures, it is a fundamental part of the cloud native stack. That's great. And if you have to look into the crystal ball for 2022, and two things. One, is there a trend that you think will take off in 2022 that you're really excited about? And secondly, is there something that's going to be a trend that you think is too under the radar that we're not talking about enough? Oh, gosh, two very difficult questions. <laughs> so I think the first trend that I do think is going to start happening, which I like, and I'm sorry, I'm very service mesh, you know, myopic in this world, but I think it's becoming a little bit more plumbing. For a long time, service mesh has had a lot of hype, and now I think it's going to fade, start fading to the background. And I think that's great. I think it should, you know, just like plumbing. You know, we don't really think about it. It works. We rely on it every day, but it's not something we shouldn't be plumbing experts, right? We should be experts in the, the whatever our business does. So a lot of what we're doing at Buoyant is giving uh, Linkerd adopters and, and platform owners the ability to run Linkerd without having to become Linkerd experts. Right now, there's all these wonderful stories about Linkerd. You know, HEB, the, I live in Texas, so there's a grocery store that uses a Linkerd to um, power the curbside uh, delivery and uh, curbside and delivery of groceries for p pandemic customers. Like it's really empowering, but the way, and, and oh, and we had a talk today from Entain Australia about how they 10 X their throughput using Linkerd, like all these wonderful stories, but you have to be a Linkerd adopter. Uh, sorry, of course you have to be a Linkerd adopter. You have to be a Linkerd expert to really get those gains. And, and so what I want to do with Buoyant, what we're starting to be able to do is Make that something where you don't have to be an expert. You can get the you can get the benefit without having to pay the cost and expertise. So that's one. That's I think that's a trend we'll continue to see, and certainly one that I'm actively trying to push. Nice. Um, and then the other question was about under the radar. Mm, that we're not talking about enough. That's going to be yeah. a trend. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Because I feel like everywhere in the cloud native world, we talk about things too much. So <laughs> is there something that's actually uh, under the radar? Boy, I might have to get back to you on that. That's a great question. You know, the, the things that are interesting and, and that are uh, that I think have some real opportunity to transform things um, are things like uh, WASM or, or WebAssembly. I think the initial approaches that people are trying to push into, um, you know, into the cloud native world right now are a little 
I'm not sure how much I believe them, but it does seem like there's so much opportunity there. But it's certainly not under the radar. That's like over talked about, if anything. Right. So yeah, I think there's an you know, I think the, if I have a critique of the cloud native world, it's that we tend to get a little too into our own hype and a little into our own buzz, and things get over marketed rather than under marketed. Ah, nice. Um, and then um, in terms of the you know, we looked at the the trends and that sort of thing. But since we are at KubeCon 2021, um, back to in person, there is hybrid that sort of thing. And whether it's your first KubeCon, which I'm going to guess it's not, has there been over this one or other KubeCons? Have you had like a favorite moment or memory or something about KubeCon that you really like and enjoy? Oh gosh, the thing what is enjoyable to me about every KubeCon. So this is a smaller one. You know, it's, there's a big virtual component. If you think back to 2019 or whatever the last KubeCon I went to in person, you know, it was probably five times bigger. But what happens at this conference, and you know, re regardless of whether it's big or small, is you actually get to, or I get to connect to the open source community around Linkerd. And that is profoundly gratifying because the rest of the year, my interactions with the community, or they come into the, you know, the Slack or the support forums and they have problems that they need help with, right? So they're like asking for help. And you never get people coming in. It's very rare to get people come in and say, oh, actually, you know, like he's working just fine and I love it and thank you, right? That's just, that's how people are. But in person, you have those conversations and you realize, gosh, there's so many people using Linkerd out there who we don't know about, you know, and they're really happy. It's doing things great for them. And then we'll meet them at the conference finally. So to me, that highlight over and over again is the same, which is I get to actually talk face to face to people who are using Linkerd, who are getting value out of it, you know, and who otherwise I would never have that conversation. Yeah, and I love like, you know, even with like the, the you know, if a conference gonna be smaller, it's like a lot of people are like, well, not everyone's gonna be there, but then it's like, at the same time, you get to move away from Twitter conversations, mm -hmm. where you yeah. see of, of just thousands of people, you're running from one thing to the next, and you just can't have that much time. So with, you know, when it's at this scale, that one of the most, you know, the great thing to and to your point is like you get those more meaningful and hallway conversations that you're not going to get in Zoom or in sort of overcrowded trade mm -hmm. shows. Right. right, exactly. And if anything, it's been kind of nice to have a smaller, more relaxed conference because we have had a lot more in-depth conversations this time around. And um, without that, I mean, are you even are we even having those conversations? Well, right. <laughs> right, exactly. So that's exactly. great to great to be back as far as that that goes. Um, and then one question that we often get, you know, from another uh, interesting audience to me is someone in like uh, middle school or high school says, hey, service mesh, Kubernetes, cloud native, all this stuff is great. Do you have like one or two tips of career advice? Like what should they do? Like, hey, I want to do this. This seems like a great profession, but where should I get started? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think my advice would be you need, in order to understand this stuff, uh, you know, at kind of a fundamental level, I think it's very hard to understand it by reading docs or by reading about the projects. I, I think you have to really immerse yourself in this technology because everything that we're talking about, you know, the service mesh, you know, Kubernetes, you can understand the way it works, but what's missing there is the context about all the other things that we've tried, you know, that didn't work and therefore we ended up with this shape of project. Like service mesh is totally weird. It's totally weird. We inject all of these proxies, we inject 10,000 proxies into your cluster. Like five years ago, it, that was a crazy thing to say, you know, but there is a reason why that ended up being the right architecture for the service mesh and it has to do with Kubernetes. And why is Kubernetes shaped the way it is? Well, that's because of this other stuff. And I think until you are really immersed in that world and you start getting this kind of intuitive sense for the shape of these things, it's hard to have uh, uh, a real impact or career around that. So I would say, I guess, get a job, you know, <laughs> get a job that involves using these things. And it doesn't really matter what the specifics are. Who cares if it's Kubernetes or something else? Just start having that practice every day of like, okay, I have to make this, I have to write this code. I have to deploy this thing. I've got to get the thing. Oh, it's breaking. It's three in the morning. I have to wake up. I got to deal with it. And once you do that, then I think you're setting yourself up to learn at a really rapid pace. And if you're in high school today, you know, or certainly if you're in middle school today, by the time, you know, you're in your first job, everything I've said will be like super out of date. You know, you can like watch this in five years and laugh at this, you know, old guy talking about these old things that no one uses anymore, right? But the learning process you develop doing that, that's the thing that's going to stay with you your whole life.
Yeah, then it's going to be like in elementary school. I, I first started to uh, play with Kubernetes. Right, so I, right. Um, Remember that old thing? You know, first grade right. service right. mesh. Yeah, well, they're going to be reading about it in history books. It's going to be like history book. Oh, chapter 17, <laughs> Kubernetes. In the olden days, people use Kubernetes, right? That's how it usually goes yeah. and things like that. Um, and since we are with DZone, do you use DZone? Is it helpful to you? Of course, you? 100%. Okay. Yes, yeah, great. Great source of content. Uh, I think it balances the right level of balance between technical and high level. So, yeah. All right. And last question. So for those looking to learn more about Linkerd, um, are you on Twitter? Where can people follow you? And then your website, I guess, is pretty easy to find yeah, out there. Linkerd.io. Yeah, and Buoyant.io. Either of those will give you a ton of content. And then I am on Twitter. I'm WM, so feel free to follow me. Uh, mostly WM. Actually, uh, uh, nice. Yeah, well, How did you manage? Oh, I you used to work Twitter, there. Right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's awesome. So, but, you know, mostly what I tweet about is Linkerd and Buoyant. So you'll get that content no matter which, which avenue you pursue. All right. So for the audiences out there today, talking to William from Buoyant, Linkerd, um, gave the information where you can find him on there. On Twitter, it's maybe one of the easiest handles to follow. WM, you get the best of both worlds with Buoyant and Linkerd. Uh, really great to have you here, you know, sharing your insights on service, you know, service mesh and KubeCon and everything else that you're working on. So just really huge honor for us at DZone to have you on here today, William. The honor is mine, Blake. Thanks for having me. Awesome, thank you.